sisters in Christ, we want to praise the Lord and to thank him for his goodness and his mercies that are new every day. This is Care Meeting 2021 and God has allowed that it be in this way. And uh, we praise him in all situations and circumstances. I know, of course, that we're going through some of the most difficult and challenging times of our lives, but uh, nevertheless, the Lord's mercies are sufficient to sustain and to carry us through whatever it is that we are going through. And uh, I want to turn our attention to the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 6, as we know that our theme is, I will go. That is the theme that we are working with. And as we do that, I've given the title to our message as, No Retreat, No Surrender. Yes, No Retreat, no surrender. That is the title of the message that I'm going to share with us uh, from the Word of God. So Isaiah chapter 6, uh, from verse number 8, the Bible says here, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Um, so he said, this is Isaiah, and he says, Here am I, uh, send me. Uh, and 
he said, go. Go and tell these people, be ever hearing, but never understanding. Be ever seeing, but never perceiving. Make the heart of these people calloused. Make their ears dull and their eyes, uh, and close their eyes. Otherwise, they might see and uh, with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Now, this is almost like a contradiction of the commission because God says, I have a work that needs to be done. But the question is, who will I send and who will go for us? And so Isaiah, being in the heavenly council, he says, well, here am I, send me and I will go. And uh, the Lord says to Isaiah, great, so may you go and tell these people uh, that they may see but never perceive, hear but never understand. And as you are going to be preaching, it's going to harden their hearts. In other words, the irony of Isaiah's ministry was that it was going to have the opposite effect of what it was actually intended to do. The message is meant to bring people to salvation. But in the process of uh, proclaiming, because these people in Judah had uh, decided that they were going to do things their own way. So the unintended effect of the message that they were going to hear was that it was going to make their situation and their case worse uh, before God. Instead of bringing them to conversion and salvation, they were actually going to have their situation getting worse with each message they had as Isaiah would preach uh, to them. And uh, this is the situation. In other words, Isaiah is simply being told, your ministry is not going to be easy. If you expect that it's going to be, uh, people are going to be converting and turning to God by their thousands and accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then I want to leave you under no illusion, oh dear Isaiah, that is God uh, speaking to Isaiah. I want you to be no other illusion, that you are going to be the most popular guy in town, that your messages are going to be embraced and accepted by the leaders as well as the common people in Judah. Many of the people are going to oppose what you're going to say, uh, the messages that you're going to share, the messages that you're going to preach. And as that happens, uh, God says to Isaiah, but even then, you need uh, to share the message. You need to share the word. Let me make it clear to us. It's easy to say, I will go. It's easy to make that as a motto, as a slogan, as a, you know, a, a rallying cry or a rallying call. They are calling us to uh, the gospel ministry and indeed to share the message with um, whoever and wherever we may find ourselves. But God doesn't make it, uh, I mean, God leaves us under no impression that sharing the gospel is easy. It is a challenging and it can be a challenging, uh, you know, endeavor. It can be such a challenging endeavor. As we find here, Isaiah didn't, just, the message, the commission didn't just end when Isaiah said, I will go. God then told him, okay, as you go, you need to know and to understand that it will be a long and protracted uh, ministry. It will be riddled with difficulties and frustrations and opposition and indifference. And some of the people are just going to be, you know, uh, to have an I don't care attitude as you share the message. And so this is uh, what God tells to Isaiah. So Isaiah, having been told <laughs> that it's not going to be a walk in the park, this is going to be long and difficult, and you will hardly have much to show for all your ministry. After all those years of ministering, you will have very little to show for all that labor, all that effort, very little to show for all the effort you will pour into this ministry. And so, this is not very encouraging. 
The message that Isaiah is given in this commission is not so encouraging. And it is no wonder then that we find Isaiah making an inquiry in verse number 11. Isaiah chapter 6. Then I said, for how long, Lord? So how, how long is this supposed to go on for? How long am I going to be doing this? And yet you are making it clear to me that there is going to be great unresponsiveness and indifference. In fact, some, in some cases, there is going to be open hostility against the messages. And so Isaiah says, are you, are you sure that I'm supposed to do this? If I'm supposed to do it, is it, how long is this supposed to be for? Is it for two months? Is this for half a year? Is this going to be for a year or two? And uh, so Isaiah wanted to know how long this was going to be for. And uh, the Bible, uh, God responded to him, Until the cities lie ruined and without inhabitants, until the houses are left deserted and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away and the land is utterly forsaken. So the Lord says, Isaiah, there is no retreat, no surrender. As long as there are still people in the cities and the villages of Judah, as long as there are still people on the streets of Jerusalem, as long as there are still people in the suburbs and neighborhoods of the city of Jerusalem, as long as there are still people in Lachish, as long as there are still people in Azekah, as long as there are still people anywhere in Judah, you need to preach the word. You need to proclaim it. I mean, regardless, regardless of the indifference, regardless of the hostility, regardless of the opposition that you're going to face, regardless of whatever situation, even though few people are going to accept uh, the message and uh, be converted and saved, even though only a few people are going to accept, but nevertheless, you preach the word. Your focus is not going to be on the results. Want as much as God does that uh, many and everybody be saved because God has made available the means and provision for all the people to be saved. But we can be under no illusion that everybody is going to respond. So should we fold our hands and relax? Should we then forget about it? No, the commission is go and preach the word regardless of the indifference, regardless of the hostility and opposition and words of nullification and interposition that may be uttered against uh, the message that is preached and proclaimed. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, God has given us a great commission and has given us a prophetic message and word that we need to share with a doomed world. Just like Isaiah was called in the 8th century uh, BC so that he could speak to the people of Judah and proclaim to the people of Judah about the message and uh, the impending doom and how they needed to take corrective action, uh, repenting and turning to God so that they are saved before the hammer of God's judgment would fall and they would be crushed under the iron feet of oppression by the Babylonians. Before that time would come, of course, as the prophet Amos says, a contemporary of Isaiah, chapter 3, verse number 7, when Amos says uh, that uh, uh, surely the Lord God does nothing until and unless he reveals uh, his plans and purposes through his servants, the prophets. And so God called Isaiah at this particular time in history to reach out to the people of Judah with a message of hope a message of salvation so that the people would turn and be saved. The end was fast approaching, but God would not allow that the nation would meet its doom before they had an opportunity to be saved. And so God has called us at such a time as this. God has called the Advent Movement for such a time as this, as we near the end of the world's history. As history approaches a cataclysmic collision with eternity, God has called us at such a time as this to give the trumpet a certain sound, to sound the trumpet and loud, let it ring, telling the world that Jesus comes again. Indeed, to tell the world that Jesus saves, Jesus saves. But even as we do that, 
Not everybody is going to be excited and say, glory, hallelujah. Jesus saves, glory, hallelujah. Jesus is coming again. Some are going to remain unmoved, indifferent. But even then, God says to us, do not be discouraged. Do not be dissuaded. Do not be disheartened. If when you give the best of your service, telling the world that the Savior is coming, do not be discouraged. When men don't believe you, when some remain indifferent, uh, but uh, he will understand and he will say, well done. Somebody wrote a song like that. This is the kind of message that God gave to Isaiah. After Isaiah said, I will go, God told him clearly, it's not going to be easy. You are not going to be the most popular guy in town. Some people are going to be mad and angry at you. And let me put it to us that the world is increasingly becoming indifferent to the preaching of the word. The world is increasingly becoming hostile to the preaching of the word. The world is becoming increasingly uh, count, is counteracting the morality, the good uh, standards and righteousness that come out of the pages of God's word. The world is counteracting those with alternative ways of thinking and living. And it's, as that happens, it's increasingly becoming difficult to preach the word as it is in God's word. Increasingly difficult. Even as we look in the church today, it is observed by leaders and missiologists within the church that uh, our methods of evangelism are increasingly becoming less uh, effective. The effectiveness is increasingly decreasing. Our methods of evangelism, you know, back in the days when you would pitch a tent, whether in Kwekwe or in Gweru, or you would just pitch a tent, put a uh, PA system, and start singing, people would just stream out of their homes, and before you know it, the tent is full. But it's not so anymore. These days, sometimes, the people who may actually show up if you do that are the police to say that your neighbors are complaining that you're making noise for them. You know, it, this is the kind of world that we are living in. And so, the Bible says, yes, as Jesus says, as you answer to the gospel call and you say, I will go, as you respond to the Great Commission, you just have to know that it's not going to be a walk in the park. It's not going to be easy and, uh, you know, it's not going to be that easy. But even then, God says, you need to go nevertheless. You know, Isaiah was almost feeling discouraged, disheartened. And, uh, you know, he said, well, what's the point then? What's the point? If my preaching is only going to harden their hearts, close their eyes, and, uh, you know, block their ears, and they're not going to respond, what is the point then? And uh, so he says, how long am I supposed to do this? How long am I supposed to do this? And God says, I love those words. I, I, you, you, you allow me to read them again. And so he says, until the cities lie ruined, if Kweko is still standing, if Gwe, there are still people in Gweru, if there are still people in Jombe, if there are still people in Harare, in Ulawayo, if the, as long as there are still people in the villages, in the provinces, as long as there are still people, uh, these villages and cities are still inhabited. God says, until the cities lie ruined, as long as they are not yet ruined, preach the word uh, without inhabitants, until houses are left deserted, and, and the fields ruined and ravaged, until the Lord has sent everyone far away, and the land is utterly forsaken. Isaiah, there is no number of years that the Lord is going to give you and say, well, you're going to preach for five years. God says, as long as there are still people in the cities, as long as there are the villages are still inhabited, you preach the word in season and out of season. You preach the word. And you know, sometimes, if you were to look at the efforts and uh, the resources, the time that we put into evangelism, and sometimes the kind of results that may come out in some instances, it's easy to be discouraged. But God is, is saying, I've not called you to uh, 
you know, effectiveness, although that is not a bad thing, but he has called us primarily to faithfulness, to be faithful to the proclamation of the word that is entrusted uh, to the church, that is given to us. And so this is God's call and his expectation. And he says, yours is to do the planting. But as to how the seed is going to sprout uh, and grow and yield much fruit, that we have to entrust to God. We have to entrust to God. And so Isaiah is told it's not going to be easy. But don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged when you look at the results. May you simply focus on preaching the word, on being faithful in proclaiming the word as it was given to him, uh, as it was entrusted uh, to him. This is uh, what Isaiah was told to do and what, in, what we also need uh, to be aware of and what we need to do. And so, this is God's call and his expectation. Uh, my dear brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us and makes it clear that even for us, in our own time, in our own time, things are not going to be easy. Things are not going to be rosy. It's not a walk in the park, proclaiming the gospel. Maybe some of you have worked in this uh, for so many years. Maybe some of you started preaching that Jesus is coming again before some of us were born. Maybe some of you have been uh, gospel ministers, elders in the church. You have been members in the church looking forward to the blessed hope. Uh, the Bible, God says, do not grow weary, do not grow tired. May you keep on keeping on because one of these good days, the trumpet is going to sound and the eastern sky is going to be decorticated as Jesus comes again. And so Isaiah, he was almost getting discouraged. How long am I supposed to do this? It doesn't seem like uh, there's going to be much uh, profit. It doesn't seem like there's going to be, uh, you know, much, uh, uh, a great yield. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 8, uh, Isaiah chapter 8, verse number 16, you find a place where Isaiah uh, got, you know, uh, even, uh, we don't know how long it has been preaching by now, when we come to this point. But it come to a point where he was almost, you know, uh, getting so, uh, I mean, he, 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 oh, well, let me read the verse. And it says here, bind up this testimony of warning and seal up God's instructions among my disciples. I will wait for the Lord, Lord who is hiding, hiding his face from the descendants of Jacob. I will put my trust uh, in him. Here am I, and the children the Lord has given me, we are for signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells on Mount Zion. Now Isaiah came to a point where he said, well, I've been preaching, man. I've been preaching for so long. But it looks like, I mean, this is not working. This is not helping. And so he says, now this is what I'll do. May you please bind up my test, I mean, the testimony, in other words, the messages that he had received from God, the sermons that he had preached, he had been written down, and he says, may you bind them up and keep them among my disciples, which means there were people in Isaiah's time who were faithful, who believed in God's word, and some of these worked closely with Isaiah, supporting him in the work that he was doing. And he says, may you keep these words, among my disciples because at, a, at some point in time these words will come to pass. They will be remembered. And he says this for me I just wait for God uh, to do his work and to do his own, um, you know, to fulfill his purposes. And he says but as for me and the children that the Lord gave me we are for signs and wonders in Israel. We are for signs and, and wonders in Israel. Almost like a uh, you know, Joshua, when he says, choose whom you will serve, whether the gods were served by your fathers across the river Euphrates or the gods you worshipped in Egypt, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Isaiah came to that kind of point. And I believe every family, every believer has to come to a point in their faith experience where they say, now it's no longer about what people are doing or saying at church. 
It's no longer about my community. It's no longer about anybody else. It's the Lord and I, the Lord and my family. And it's, we need to come to such a point because when we look around us, we may get discouraged seeing even people who once believed, not only believed, but once proclaimed and led in the work, when they begin to abandon those positions they once held and those positions they once called others to. And so Isaiah comes to a point where he says, well, <laughs> doesn't look like the preaching is helping much. And so may you just bind my testimony among my disciples. At some point, this, is, this will come to pass. This will be fulfilled. All my dear brothers and sisters, yes, we are saying, I will go. And uh, God is making it clear to us in no uncertain terms that even as we go, it's not uh, going to be easy. And uh, this is what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4 from verse number 1. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. Paul says to Timothy, a time will come when people will not endure sound doctrine, but preach the word. In season and out of season, rebuke, correct, encourage, fulfill your ministry, endure the hardships uh, that come with ministry, and standing for the word of God. You know, the unpopularity to the young people who are in college, or who are in school, is, is sometimes the ridicule that people face in our workplaces. Maybe the families that you are married into. Maybe you are the only Adventist in your family. Whatever the situation, whatever the situation, uh, Paul says to Timothy, endure the hardships that come with standing for the right. Because the time will come. In fact, the time is already here. When people don't care anymore what the Bible says, people just believe whatever they want. You know, whatever their, their pastor says, whatever their prophet says, whatever their priest says, they say, well, that's what you're going to go with. But Paul says to Timothy, keep your head in all situations. Remain composed. Remain focused. Hold on to the faith. Hold on to Jesus. Keep your faith in all situations. And uh, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 3, tells us that in the last days, scoffers will come. People who will make fun of the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. People who will make fun of the fact that God created the world. People who will make fun and scorn at the idea that Jesus could have died for our salvation. And people who will laugh and the idea that Jesus is coming again. And they'll say that, oh, well, I mean, this has been preached and proclaimed for thousands of years again. Where is the sign of his coming? In other words, discouraging situations. Discouraging situations. Instead of many turning to Christ, many men and women, young and old, instead of them turning to Christ, increasingly there will be voices of scoffers and people who will mock and ridicule the idea of Jesus coming again. But Paul says, in all situations, keep your head. Keep your head in all situations. And Jesus in the great um, eschatological discourse, in other words, when Jesus talked about the end of the world and the signs when the end will be approaching, Jesus gives this message in Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24 from verse number 9. Where Jesus says, 
Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. People like Isaiah. People like Jeremiah. You know, Jeremiah, they call him the weeping prophet. Uh, and they gave him a nickname, Mago Misaviv, which means terror on every side. Because he was proclaiming and telling them of the terrifying uh, approach of the Babylonian forces and what they were going to do to Jerusalem. And they said, this, this prophet, there's nothing good to tell us. All his sermons are terrifying. And so they gave him a nickname, Mago Misaviv, terror all around. And so, uh, you know that Jeremiah slept in the face, literally, at another time thrown into, the, into a system, and they really just wanted to get rid of him. It was not easy. It was not easy. The opposition, the hostility uh, against Jeremiah. And as the prophetic movement today, the Advent movement, is in no better or no different position than that. But God says, even then, we need to preach the word. So Jesus makes it clear here in Matthew 24 verse 9, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Talks here about many have experienced this already through history. Many experienced it in the first century throughout history, but um, in a special sense, also as we come to the end, uh, to the very end, at that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people because of the increase of wickedness. The love of most will grow cold. But the one who, in, who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. You know, there's quite a lot here. There's quite a lot. First, there's mention that the uh, opposition and um, hostility is going to then uh, blossom into uh, persecution. And then, at that time, many will turn away from the faith. Men who once believed, men who once taught, Men who once preached are going to turn away from the faith. You know, in the world today, one of the challenges is not only uh, that of trying to reach the unreached. Within our countries, within our territories, within our unions and conferences and church spheres of influence, but also there's this uh, place that is called the Telford Window. You know, in the world which covers the Middle East, North Africa, the Middle East, going into Asia. And so we find that uh, in that part of the world, so many people have never even heard that Jesus ever came, even in the first place. And so we find that uh, the, the great, that is a great challenge on its own, reaching that part of the world. But an even greater challenge is that many people in historically Christian countries are the ones who are now turning away from Christianity and despising Christianity, undermining Christianity, opposing Christianity, and bringing all sorts of uh, restrictions, you know, uh, so much that you find uh, the celebration of nudity and uh, the promotion of LGBTQ issues. These are not things that are done by uh, people who are in Hinduism in India or Shintoism in Japan, but people that were coming from historically Christian countries, the same countries that used to send missionaries around the world, they have become themselves mission fields. Mission fields. And so, uh, the Bible says, Jesus says, wickedness shall abound. Wickedness shall abound. And, and many people's hearts shall, uh, faith shall grow cold because of the abundance or uh, uh, abounding wickedness in and around the world. And so, my brothers and sisters, we find here that Jesus, I mean, the, our message is no retreat, no surrender. I want to close by pointing uh, to the example or the story of Hiro Onada. Now, Hiro Onada was a Japanese soldier who was um, uh, stationed in the Philippines on one of the islands 
of the Philippines in 1942. You know, the Japan attacked the Philippines on the 8th of uh, December 1941. And that's how the Philippines was brought into Second World War. And as this war was being pro uh, executed, uh, many Japanese soldiers stationed all over the place. And Hiro Onada was stationed at this island that, is, that overlooks Manila Bay. It was a strategic place where he was put. And his commanding officer told him that he was supposed to stay in that place. And he was not supposed to move. And he said, yes, sir. He took the instructions as they were given to him. And uh, the officer went, you know, and in the course of that war, the Philippines lost this war in 1945. They lost the war to the uh, Americans. Uh, and so the Japanese uh, left the Philippines and they retreated back to their country. In 1945, they September the 2nd, they surrendered. They gave up. They surrendered. But this man, Hiro Onada, this soldier remained in his position and he was faithful to the instructions that were given to him even though the war had ended. But Hiro Onada did not move from his position. He was faithful uh, according to the instructions that were given to him and he fought on after the war had already ended. Not for six months, not just for a year, not just for five years. He fought on and stayed on that island, living in the jungle. He lived on and fought a war that had apparently ended already. And you know for how long? He fought on until 1974. That means for 29 more years, he was still in the jungle. And, you know, they tried all they could, sending messages, trying to take him out until he was declared dead. They said maybe the guy died. Eventually, when someone came from Japan, uh, went over to the island and went into the dense jungles of that tropical island, they found Hiro was still there. This man tried to persuade him, please, let's go back. The war ended a long time ago. But the Lord had said, you are not my commanding officer. I was, I'm not here by your instruction. And so they, no one could uh, persuade Hiro to leave that island. So eventually they had to go back to Japan and they had to look for his commanding officer, the one who put him on that island and gave him the instructions that he was still following 29 years after the war had ended. That commanding officer came uh, went into the jungle uh, wearing his uh, you know, uniform and then uh, called for Onada and told him that Onada, Officer on Onada, now you are dismissed. The war is over. That is when he surrendered and he gave in. And so, my brothers and sisters, Onada became a hero, not only to the Philippines, but also to Japan. He became a hero, a man who stood by the instructions until the very end. Isaiah says, Lord, since things are going to be so difficult, how long am I supposed to preach? And he's told as long as there's still people, you preach the word in season and out of season. Oh, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the message that God has given to us. Jesus gave us a great commission. And with this great commission, we are not going to retreat and we are not going to surrender. Like Hiro Onada, we will stand for the right even though the heavens may fall, until the trumpet will sound and time shall be no more. May God help us to be faithful because the voice that said, that said go ye therefore, has not yet said, stop ye therefore, or come ye back therefore. That voice has not yet spoken until our commanding officer, our Lord, Master and Savior, soon coming Savior and Redeemer Jesus Christ, until the trumpet will sound, let us preach the word. Let us proclaim it in season and out of season and not be ashamed of the gospel. May the Lord bless us and strengthen us as we go with the message. Oh yes, I will go, even though it will not be easy. Jesus never said it would be easy, but he said, I will never leave nor forsake you until the very end of the age. Remember, Isaiah, remember, Jeremiah, remember, Paul, remember, Hiro Onada, 
God is counting on you. It's your turn and it's my turn. May God bless us and may God help us. Let us close our eyes in prayer. Our kind and most gracious Heavenly Father, may glory and honor come to you, Lord, for only you are worthy to be praised. Lord, we thank you for the privilege to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and the privilege which is ours to invite others to salvation through this name. It's increasingly becoming difficult, but we thank you for the assurance that you'll be with us until the end. As long as there are still people out there, please, Lord, may you help us to keep on answering to the call and saying, yes, I will go. And as we do that, may our own salvation be secured. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, we pray now and forevermore. Amen.